the board summary for the rules for the quantization, a simple classical quantization of uh, one dimensional systems. The rule itself is very simple, although we went through some uh, pains to get it involving area functions and asymptotic forms and so on. But the basic rule is really simple, and it has a simple interpretation also. Uh, it says that the area of the ordinate in the phase space, which is otherwise loop integral PDX, is an integer plus a half times 2 pi h bar. 2 pi h bar is the same thing as Planck's original constant h. So you can think of the area of Planck cell, so-called Planck cell, as being an area of h in phase space. Uh, I'll remind you that the origin of this, well, let's see, just to sketch the orbits in phase space for a typical oscillator, there'll be things that look like this. And the quantized orbits are the ones that have an area of n plus a half Planck cells. So the middle one, the center one, has an area of a half. And then after that, it goes three halves, five halves, and so on. So the area of each little annular region that connects one, uh, one uh, quantized orbit to the next has an area of uh, one, uh, one Planck cell. Now, I'll remind you that the origin of this formula is, a, is, is, that, uh, is the basic idea that as a particle moves around its orbit, it accumulates a phase, which is the integral of TDX divided by h bar. This is a very old idea and actually precedes uh, even the modern quantum. It's part, this goes back to the days of the old quantum theory. In any case, you can imagine it tracing out a wave as it goes around its orbit. Now, in addition to that, it loses a phase of, of uh, minus pi over 2 every time it passes through a turning point. And since we have two turning points in a typical oscillator, that's a total lost phase. And the answer then has to be an integer multiple of 2 pi in order to get phase coherence. I'm just repeating some things I said in the previous lecture. So this has to be uh, equal to 2 n pi. And this condition in this form is the same as the condition up above. It's just rewritten in slightly different language. Here, this has to be a loop interval if you're going to go all the way around the orbit. All right. Now, that's the basics of the rule. So I'd like to begin today by uh, making a simple uh, illustration of how we can apply this rule. Let's uh, work with the uh, ordinary harmonic oscillator with the Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m plus m omega squared over 2x squared, as I guess you know. Uh, we'll first think about this classically. <coughs> the, uh, if we set h equals e, we get an orbit of energy e. And if we plot this in phase space, x and p, uh, the equation is that of an ellipse in phase space. So it looks something like this. And, uh, and to use the Borsomerfeld rule, we're going to need the area of the orbit. Well, the area of an ellipse is uh, pi times the semi-major axis times the semi-minor axis. Uh, so the, let's call this x max here is the maximum position for x. Uh, that's the x-intercept of the, of the orbit. We get that by setting uh, momentum p equals to 0, so the kinetic energy term goes away, and then solving for x. And if you do this, you find that you get uh, twice the energy E divided by m omega squared. Likewise, let's call this P max here, which is the uh, maximum value of momentum. That's a momentum intercept. We get that by setting x equal to 0 and then solving for P. So that becomes equal to the square root of 2 m e, like this. And thus, the area is, you can, do, you can calculate the area without doing any integrals. You can the formula for the area of the ellipse. It's pi times the semi major axis, which is the square root of 2 pi, uh, excuse me, 2 me, uh, times the semi minor axis, which is the square root of 2 e divided by m omega squared. Or maybe I've got the semi major and minor axis, we, axis reversed, but it won't matter because it's just the product of the two. And uh, you multiply this out, and you can see the masses will cancel. And what you get is a 2 pi times the energy E divided by the frequency. <coughs> now, by bohr sommerfeld that has to be equal to n plus a half times a 2 pi h bar on the quantized orbits. And you can see we can cancel the 2 pi's here and then solve for the energy. And the result is, is that the energy is equal to n plus a half times h bar omega, which uh, you recognize as the exact answer. So without much trouble, uh, for the harmonic oscillator, we get the exact answer. For some of the quantization, gives the exact energy of this. WKB theory does not give the exact wave functions for the harmonic oscillator, but it does give the exact energy of All right. Uh, now, I'm going to run through a series of examples just because it's so easy to do them, and, uh, and we might as well have some fun just getting some Answers. We'll start with some answers we know like harmonic oscillator. 
standing next to a particle in a box. So here's x. Here's uh, let's say x equals l is the size of the box, and the potential energy is that it's zero inside the box, but it's infinity outside. So these are hard walls, and the length size of the box is l. But of course, the classical particle just bounces back and forth in the box like this. Uh, to get the orbits in phase space, we need to think about phase space. So let's plot x and p. Here's the line x equals l again. And the particle is free inside the box. Let's say it has a momentum p0, just to distinguish the, the, the momentum of the particle from the variable momentum p here. So the orbit going across on the right side is, is at a straight line uh, with a constant velocity at, at momentum p0. And when it gets to the opposite wall, it bounces back, which just means it changes the sign of momentum. So it changes the minus p, p0 and goes back this way with a momentum minus p0. Unless the orbit in phase space is really kind of a rectangle, well, it's a discontinuous jump from here to there because it's a hard wall. But I'll fill it in like this as if it went continuously from one to the other and then back up. And you can see that the orbit is a, is a rectangle in phase space. Now, here's the tricky part about the particle in the, in the box. And that is, is that instead of having a phase shift of pi over 2 at a turning point, we have a phase shift of pi. And the reason is, is that this is a hard wall. Remember where this pi over 2 came from. It came from taking the you know, potential energy, which would look like this, and we had the actual energy, and then we looked at the wave function in the neighborhood of the, of the turning point. This is what you call a soft wall, where the, where the particle, you know, is, 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 its velocity decreases in a continuous manner. And there was some complicated analysis to get this pi over 2, although once you get it, it's a simple rule. In the case of a hard wall, the phase shift is minus pi. Uh, you can see that because uh, the boundary conditions are that the wave function has to vanish at the wall. And so you, minus pi means the reflected wave is, is, mi is minus the incident wave. That's needed to make the sum of the two waves be equal to zero at the wall. So here the, uh, the more simple condition is going to be that the area, instead of being n plus a half, it's going to be n plus 1 times 2 pi h bar. A slightly modified quantization condition. Now, as far as the area is concerned, however, this is quite easy because it's just the area of a rectangle. The height is twice p0 and the width is l. So this is equal to 2p0 times l. However, p0 is just the momentum of the particle, so that's the square root of 2 m e, which is the energy. And so I put this in and I'll get 2 times l times the square root of 2 m e is equal to. N plus, a, n plus 1 now times 2 pi h bar. And uh, so I'll cancel the 2's here. And uh, maybe I'll leave it in the form of p0 for the time being. If I do that, what we get is that p0 is equal to n plus 1 times pi h bar. And then we get the energy e, which is p0 squared over 2m, which is divided by l. p0 squared over 2m, which is n plus 1 squared pi squared h bar squared over 2m l squared, which you recognize as being the correct formula for the energy levels of the particle in the box. Here the n goes 0, 1, 2, 3, so n plus 1 goes 1, 2, 3, 4. The ground state is n equals 1 now, not n equals 0. All right. So that's another simple example. Um, now, unfortunately, I have to cover this up, but I'll do another example. Uh, Yes. Before you go that, I'm sorry, I just the explanation of why we have n plus one half when we calculate the quantization for the area for the square well versus I'm sorry, n plus one for the square well versus n plus one half. It's because it's because the one the one half comes from this this uh, the, the n plus one half that applied to the harmonic oscillator came from the fact that there's a phase shift of minus pi over two when you go through a turning point. It goes through two turning points. And that's why you multiply it times two. So it's half of a phase cycle of 2 pi. That's where the 1 half comes from up here. Okay. But on a hard wall, you get a phase shift of pi at each wall because the reflected wave and the instant wave have to cancel out. Oh, OK. So it's a, it's a, a hard wall gives you a different phase shift. Okay. And that's why it doubles the amount of phase and it becomes n plus 1. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, now, um, uh, I'll do another example. This is uh, this will be the uh, what will this one be? This one will be the rigid rotor. 
So a rigid rotor, uh, let's do it classically first. A rigid rotor has two masses, M1 and M2. They don't have to be the same. This is actually a model of a diatonic molecule, which we'll come back to in, in, a, in a few weeks. Let's say there's the center of mass right there, so I can put an origin and coordinate system here, X and Y, the center of mass. And let's introduce an azimuthal angle. The thing is rotating about its center of mass. And now, this is all classical for the time being. Uh, the moment of inertia is equal to uh, the reduced mass mu times capital R squared, where R is the length of the rigid rotor, and mu is the reduced mass, so it's 1 over mu is equal to 1 over mu 1 plus 1 over mu 2, like that. Now, the classical Lagrangian, Lagrangian is a kinetic minus potential energy, but for a rigid rotor, this is a free rotor, there is no potential energy, so it's just the kinetic energy. And as you know, the kinetic energy of a rotor is uh, one half the moment of inertia times the, the angle, the derivative of the angle, the omega frequency squared, which on frequency is phi dot here, it's the rate of rotation. Which obviously it's just constant, it's just turning around and around. Uh, let's translate this into Hamiltonian. For that, we need to first of all find the momentum, which is, let's say, we'll call it P phi, because it's conjugate to the angle phi. This is dl d phi dot. And that becomes equal to i times phi dot, which you uh, easily see by differentiating. i times phi dot, however, is the same thing as the angular momentum of the rotor. Well, now we have a problem because the angular momentum L is not to be confused with Lagrangian L. So let me call the angular momentum LZ just to distinguish it. But also, if we think about the z-axis coming out of the board, it really is the z component of angular momentum of the thing rotating. All right. And then the Hamiltonian is equal to, so P phi is the same thing. The momentum, as we say, conjugate to phi is the same thing as the z component of angular momentum. But the classical Hamiltonian is P phi times phi dot minus the Lagrangian. And if you work this out, you want to express it in terms of LZ, not in, phi, in terms of phi dots. You get LZ squared divided by twice the moment of inertia. So I'll just write this again and put a box around it because this is, a, this is the classical Hamiltonian. Now, what about the quantum mechanics of the rigid rotor? Here we're going to use a process of quantization. This is really ad hoc and kind of hand wavy. It's just following intuition. But it works like this. Uh, there is a pro the process of quantization is that of going from a classical Hamiltonian to a quantum one. Uh, the, the, the quantization that we've used so far in these recent lectures has been called, is what, is what is called direct quantization. I didn't use that terminology, but that's what it amounts to. Uh, in direct quantization, what you do is you take the x's and p's, which are the classical variables, and you've got a classical Hamiltonian, h of x and p, and you reinterpret x as an operator, which is multiplication by x on, on, a, on a wave function, psi of x, and you reinterpret p as a minus i h bar d x as an operator acting on psi of x. So the wave function lives on the configuration space x, and, and this is transcriptions of classical variables into quantum operators, and then the Hamiltonian becomes an operator. And this is called the Dirac quantization, or the Dirac rules for quantization. Uh, and it, what it takes you is not so much to, it doesn't take you to the Ket space, it takes you to the space of wave functions on, on configuration space. Now, Without, without questioning whether it's valid or not, let's just do Dirac quantization in these, in these, in these other coordinates now. The, the angular coordinates, the angular coordinates phi, and the conjugate uh, momentum p phi. So let's apply this to the case of the rigid rotor. In the case of the rigid rotor, this suggests that uh, phi, the classical phi, goes over into a multiplication by phi. Uh, it suggests that the wave function is going to be some wave function defined on the configuration space, which is the phi angle space. And it suggests that P phi, which is the same thing as LZ, should go over into minus i h bar d d phi. And thus the uh, quantum Hamiltonian is obtained by replacing LZ by, by minus i h bar d d phi. And hence the Schrodinger equation should be this minus h bar squared divided by twice the moment of inertia, d squared psi d phi squared is equal to e psi of phi. This is the Schrodinger equation uh, based on Dirac quantization. And this is easy to solve. And you find that the psi of phi 
is equal to e to the i m phi, where m is an integer. And if you normalize it, you have to divide by the square root of 2 pi. And m is equal to any integer, positive or negative. So it's 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2, and so on like that. All right. Configuration space here is we want to plot this here for phi. Here's the wave function psi. The configuration space only goes out to 2 pi like this. And uh, we're, the wave functions are e to the i m phi because they have to be, the wave function, whatever it is, it has to be periodic because 2 pi is the same as, as phi physically. The rotor returns to its original configuration. So the wave functions have to be periodic. And this is a, the solution we get by solving Schrodinger equation. That's why you have e to the i m phi. So periodic functions. That's why you get an m and n is because m has to be an n to make this, this periodic. So this is a different set of boundary conditions than we had with the particle in the box. Instead of hard walls, these are periodic boundary conditions. But notice that there's no, now there's no turning points. The angle just increases in phi and keeps on going around, increasing and increasing. So the bohr sommerfeld condition is going to change again because now we won't have any one half at all. Will just be multiple, in, integer multiple to, to pi. Uh, well, to go through the details of that, uh, let's go back to the classical mechanics, which we have to do to apply more Sommerfeld, and uh, let's talk about the uh, phase space for the for the system. So the um, so the phase space is going to be uh, phi coordinate here and a p phi, which is the same thing as an lz coordinate here, and we go out to two pi, the periodic and the annual. Uh, uh, phi, a phi, a phi like this, the period of 2 pi. And uh, what is the classical motion? Classical motion is obviously one where just phi dot is constant. It just rotates at a constant velocity. Or equivalently, LZ is constant. So that means a classical orbit is one that just goes straight across like this at some given value of LZ, which is the constant LZ for the, for the, uh, for the motion. Unlike the particle in the box, it doesn't reflect and come back. It just keeps on going. This line is the same as this line. If you like, the phase space is really a cylinder. And it just goes around and around and around. All right. So, the bohr condition has to be this. It has to be the area, which is going to be the loop integral of p phi d phi, must be equal to an integer, which I'll call m instead of n now, times 2 pi h bar with no one half. Let me write it this way. It's m plus zero to emphasize that. With no one half because there's no turning points. On the other hand, this integral is just equal to 2 pi times LZ. And so look what you get. You get LZ, the 2 pi's cancel, is equal to mh bar, which is the correct quantization of the z component of angular momentum. And for the energy, you get LZ, so you use a classical formula, LZ squared over 2i, which becomes m squared h bar squared divided by twice the moment of inertia. And these are the energy levels for the, uh, for the rigid rotor, the correct answer. Uh, the quantized orbits are orbits that go across here for m equals 0, so it is right on the, 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 the phi line, and they, they're just orbits that the, the one like this. The area between them is a single quant cell. Okay, so that's the rigid rotor. Um, now, um, there's an example in the book which I think I'm going to skip. Uh, I'll let you read it in the book. Uh, this is the bouncing ball that uh, Sakurai talks about. Uh, and uh, so this is the idea of you drop the ball, it just bounces up and down. So it's a particle in a gravitational field, except uh, it looks like this. If I plot the potential energy, let's say, of x, the potential energy v of x is equal to mgx if we're in a gravitational field. So this is the potential energy. And so the curve of the potential energy is a straight line like this. Except if it's, if it's a bouncing ball, then we put a hard wall on the floor at uh, x equals 0. And then for some energy d like this, the particle bounces, bounces back and forth between this, this turning point and that one. Here you've got one hard turning point with a phase shift of pi, and a soft one with a phase shift of pi over 2. So now you've got an m plus 3 quarters, actually, in the quantization condition. Anyway, I'll let you, I'll let you think about this one. You, you can read about it in the book.
Right. Yes. Is the thing that makes um, the core semiconductor condition in all of these examples actually the right answer that the, the potential is going to make less than the like that? Yeah, the reason these answers are all coming out exact so far is because the uh, uh, because the, uh, the potential is, is at most a quadratic polynomial. Um, actually, in this case, it doesn't come out exactly. You get to you get approximations to the roots of the area function, which is, you can see this table in the book gives you comparison exactly the approximate answers. Um, before leaving this uh, subject, I want to mention something about a multi-dimensional case, which is also interesting. The Planck cell in one dimension, as I mentioned, is, is, uh, is 2 pi h bar. That's the area of a single cell. If you're in multiple dimensions, uh, it's, it has to be a power of this. So for example, in 3D, if you take a three-dimensional problem, uh, but this is the volume of a Planck cell in, in phase space. Planck cells are in phase space. So this is actually in the six-dimensional phase space of position and momentum of a particle in three dimensions. But the basic rule is, is that each quantum state occupies a single quantum cell. I'll show you something you can do with this now. Uh, let's suppose we have a region of three-dimensional space. Uh, let's call it the region R. And let's say that its volume is capital B. And let's say that inside this region, what we've got is a free particle, but now in three dimensions. So it's Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m, but I want to emphasize that the momentum is now a free vector, like this. Mm -hmm. So this is a particle in a box, except we'll let the box have an arbitrary shape, and it's in 3D. All right, then. Now let's let n of e be the number of, uh, of eigenstates. Let's make it e naught. n of e naught be the number of, of energy eigenstates. Uh, uh, with uh, energy which is less than or equal to E naught. We can call this the number function, the number of eigenstates with an energy less, less than or equal to a given energy. Uh, I'm going to apply the, just this basic Planck cell rule to this, and what we'll obtain is an estimate of N, N of E naught as a semi classical estimate. So, according to this idea that a single Planck cell corresponds to a single quantum state, what we need to do is to integrate the phase space volume, which is now six dimensional, it's d cubed x, d cubed p, over all three position, three momentum variables uh, of the region where the Hamiltonian, the value of the Hamiltonian is less than or equal to E naught, the value of E naught over here. And then we need to divide this by the Planck cell in three dimensions, which is 2 pi h bar cubed. This is a six dimensional integral now. Looks like it's hard to do, but actually it's not difficult at all because as far as the x in this breaks up into an x integral, which is just taken over the region R because that's the only place the particle can be. And then it's times a momentum integral, three-dimensional momentum integral, which is taken over the region where let's say the magnitude of P is less than or equal to P naught where P naught is the magnitude of momentum corresponding to E naught, so that E naught is equal to P naught squared over 2m. Okay? Or, in other words, P naught is equal to the square root of, 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 of 2m E naught. So, this is easy because the first integral just gives you the volume of the region. In the second integral, you just use the formula for the volume of the sphere. It's 4 thirds pi times p naught cubed. And if we put this together, we get the, the estimate for the number of energy eigenstates, and it's equal to the volume of the divided by 2 pi h bar cubed times 4 thirds pi. And then for p naught, p naught cubed, I'll write this as 2m e naught to the 3 halves power. And this is, gives you the answer. Uh, I can clean this up by collecting powers of pi and stuff like that, but this is the basic answer that shows you the structure of the formula. Um, you've, I'm sure you've seen all seen this formula before. You, you use this in, uh, in statistical mechanics when you want to count states. Usually they make it a box, and then they use plane waves, and they count the number of plane wave solutions 
of a given energy, so an energy less than a given energy, and you end up, you'll end up and you're all done with this formula. All I'm doing here really is to show you that what underlies those counting, counting states is the basic fact is that in the phase space, every state occupies a cell of 2 pi h bar. And this is not restricted to free particles, although free particle makes it easy to do the integral. You can just do it apply for any, any system and you get good estimates for this number function. If you differentiate this to get dn, dE, this is what you call the density of states. This is, the differentiation is easy. Uh, this is the number of states per unit energy interval, which appears in, in solid state physics and all over the place. All right. So those are all examples of uh, aspects of the uh, of the uh, of force of the um, Okay. So this is the all, all I want to say about uh, WKB theory and semi-classical methods for now. So are there any, any questions about this before I go on? Yes. How do turning points work in multiple dimensions? Uh, well, that's more complicated. And, and when I uh, when I write a formula down like this, we're kind of blowing off the one half. We're just thinking that n is large enough so one half won't matter. I think that's the simplest answer. Um, the, the multidimensional problems are, are more complicated. Uh, they, uh, the classical mechanics is more complicated. Some of them are in integrable, and some of them are not. They're chaotic, and that, that affects the whole picture. In the days of the old quantum theory, people didn't understand that distinction, uh, at, although they knew about integrable systems, because those are the ones that are solvable. It turns out that integrable systems have multiple periods, and that the one-dimensional or Sommerfeld rule that I've written down already gets applied to each of the periodic motions in, in the integrable system. And so in the period from about 1911, when Bohr worked out his, his, his results for the hydrogen atom, Bohr really did a one-dimensional problem, even though the hydrogen atom is 3D. Uh, Sommerfeld generalized this uh, to uh, integrable systems in, in more than one dimension, which is why his name gets attached to it as well. Um, and uh, so then you get these quantization conditions, one for each of the degrees of freedom. That's that, that's the quantization rule in more detail where you take into account turning points and stuff in, in many dimensions. This is a this is a simpler approach in which I'm actually ignoring phase shifts. Uh, but it's an interesting result because it shows you that the number of the number of states and the density of states is proportional to the volume independent of the shape of the container, which is something that would be quite hard to get by working with a wave. It's okay for a, a box because you know the wave functions for a box. But if you make it a blobby shaped thing, nobody knows what the wave functions are. So this is still correct. It's, it's only an asymptotic result, but it's, but it's, still, it's still correct. All right. Um, Okay. In, in the days of the old quantum theory, they didn't understand these spacious the turning points because they didn't know about wave functions. So they got some answers wrong by this one half. The fact that the harmonic oscillator is, is n plus a half instead of just n was something that took a while to, you know, to emerge. But anyway, the answers they got were, in many cases, very good. And, and uh, so everybody knew they were on the right track, but they didn't really understand what this, what this quantization condition meant. Okay. All right, so I'd like to turn now uh, to a, a new topic, which is the, uh, the um, elementary harmonic oscillator, which you all have seen before. So I expect a good deal of this will be reviewed. And there's no eraser in here. Uh, cover one up. No, there's no eraser. There's no eraser. Of the CLL logic flows. 
Uh, Dirac's algebraic treatment of the harmonic oscillator is the simplest and, and uh, neatest, most famous example of the solution of a quantum mechanical problem by algebraic means. What that means is that we work with the properties of the operators and their commutation relations, uh, but without uh, attempting to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation. And, and we don't do it by solving differential equations and worrying about wave functions. In the case of the harmonic oscillator and also an angular momentum theory, this is really by far uh, the most uh, effective and efficient way of, of uh, dealing with problems involving harmonic oscillators. Well, what you know, your one-dimensional harmonic oscillator is a Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2m plus m omega squared over 2x squared. Uh, this is expressing the potential energy. The potential energy is a, is a parabolic or quadratic function here, v of x. It's a function of x. This is expressing the potential energy in terms of frequency instead of the spring constant. Uh, as I expect you to know, uh, the, uh, this is frequently just a, a small amplitude approximation to a true potential. Uh, real potentials are never really x squared because um, they don't go to infinity. They have to, fall, they have to, die, they have to flatten out somewhere. Uh, so typically, the, uh, the potential energy is only, this quadratic form of the potential energy is only the approximation to a real potential near the bottom of the well. Another thing to mention is that if you have a multidimensional problem, for example, if you have two dimensions, x and y, and the potential energy as a function of x and y has a minimum somewhere like this, you imagine there's the bowl sitting down like that, you can expand the true potential without the minimum and carry out the second order, you're going to get a quadratic form in the coordinates x and y. This is a symmetric quadratic form, and it can be diagonalized by an orthogonal transformation. And the result is, is that the Hamiltonian, now the multi-dimensional Hamiltonian, will break up into a sum of one-dimensional harmonic oscillators, generally with different frequencies. The frequencies of the, of the so-called normal modes are usually not the same. They may be the same, but they're not always. Uh, but the point is, is, that, uh, is that the quadratic approximation to a potential in multi-dimensions uh, can be reduced to the problem of a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator looking like this. So it's, and so in solving the 1D problem, we're actually solving uh, multi-dimensional harmonic oscillators as well. I only drew this with two coordinates, x and y, but in some cases, the number of coordinates is, is much larger than that. The famous example is the vibrations, lattice vibrations in a solid, in which case the uh, number of coordinates is equal to the number of atoms times 3. Um, and uh, so it could be an enormously large number. And in that case, the diagonalization of the quadratic form of the potential energy amounts to obtaining the normal modes of vibration of the solid. Actually, this could be considered a classical problem, finding those normal modes. But once you find them, then each one of them becomes a single one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, which is quantized by the methods on which we set it So uh, although we'll be dealing with just one-dimensional problem, the, uh, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually applicable to multi-dimensional problems also. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a mechanical oscillator, but the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian occurs in a number of, of uh, contexts where it's not a potential energy problem. For example, a particle moving in a uniform magnetic field has a Hamiltonian which can be transformed into the form of a harmonic oscillator. Uh, uh, another very important example is uh, examples is uh, what happens in field theory in which uh, in quantum field theory, in which the modes of a free field, whether they be electromagnetic field or a field uh, uh, describing massive particles, uh, can be, again, decomposed into normal modes, and each one of those becomes a harmonic oscillator. In cases like that, the excitations of the, of the given mode are identified with particles, and we speak, for example, of photons in the quantization of the electromagnetic field, uh, which from a mathematical standpoint are very similar to the quantization of sound waves and phonons in a solid, which otherwise are just the normal modes of vibration in the solid. In any case, uh, harmonic oscillators, this is just a way of saying that harmonic oscillators have uh, many, many applications in physics. All right, so let's go back to the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator and do it. Uh, there are three constants that appear here, the mass, the h bar, and the frequency omega. And it's convenient uh, to avoid clutters of constants to choose units such, such that all three of these constants are equally one. An equivalent way of speaking of this is to say that if you take the given values of mh bar and omega, you can construct a fundamental unit of length, and this is equal to the square root of h bar divided by m omega. 
And similarly, you get a fundamental unit of momentum, which is the square root of m h bar times omega. You get a fundamental unit of energy, which is h bar omega uh, uh, of time, which is 1 over omega, and so on, etc. And uh, by choosing units like this, it's equivalent to uh, make choosing units of each of these, this length, momentum, energy, time, and so on are all equal to 1 in the unit system we choose. Uh, this is going to make the harmonic oscillator now become simply one half uh, p squared plus x squared. It's in dimensionless form now. Uh, to convert back to real units, you need to multiply or divide by these scale factors to get the actual units you want. By the way, I can only do this for a one dimensional oscillator. If I had two harmonic oscillators whose frequencies were different, I can set both frequencies equal to one. Then I'd have to. I can still set n and h bar equal to 1, but not the frequencies. Anyway, for one oscillator, we can do this. All right, uh, so this is, uh, this is the uh, quantum oscillator, let's say, at this point. So the commutation relations of the position and momentum are that their commutator is i h bar, except for setting h bar equal to 1, so it's just i. Uh, in Dirac's method, uh, he begins by defining a set of new operators. One is at A, which is defined as x plus i t divided by the square root of 2, and its remission conjugate A dagger, which is x minus i t over the square root of 2. These are, uh, the first one is called the annihilation operator, or it's also called the lowering operator. Uh, and the second one is called a, a creation operator, uh, or a raising operator. The terminology annihilation and creation is typically applied to photons, the quantization of electromagnetic field, uh, but the terminology is equivalent. Um, now, uh, these two operators are not remission, so they remember that, so they don't, uh, we don't diagonalize them. Uh, on the other hand, um, they uh, have some nice properties. In particular, let's define a new operator, which is the product of A dagger times A. Well, uh, just from the line above, this is one half of x minus i p times x plus i p. If those were c numbers instead of operators, you just multiply them together and you get one half of x squared plus p squared, which is obviously the Hamiltonian. But because these are operators, there's also a commutator that occurs. You see, you get x times i p minus p times i x divided by 2, so you get pi over 2 times the commutator of x with p. So this first term is the Hamiltonian, and the second term is pi over 2 times i, because that's what the commutator is, so it's 1 half. And so we can summarize this about then we get 1 half over the other side by saying that h is equal to n plus a half. The n operator, by the way, is called the number operator, given a name. And uh, the result of this is that the Hamiltonian is the number operator plus a half. The number operator is, uh, has some properties here. Is that first of all, the number operator is a uh, permission, which is obvious if I take its permission conjugate, it just goes into itself. And it's also non negative definite. So n is uh, one remission of two non-negative definite. The fact that it's non-negative definite it means that the eigenvalues of the number operator are non-negative. Non they can be positive or zero. Uh, it's easy to show that it's non-negative definite because if I take an arbitrary state phi and sandwich it around n, recall that the definition of a non-negative definite operator is that this expectation value has to be non-negative for all choices of phi. Well, let's see what this is. This is phi, a dagger a, phi, like this. This, however, is the square uh, of the state a phi. And the square of a state is greater than or equal to zero because that's one of the postulates of the, uh, of, uh, of the vectors in Hilbert space. It's the definition of Hilbert space, as a matter of fact, part of the definition. All right, uh, so, uh, so it's not negative definite. So the Hamiltonian is equal to this uh, number operator plus a half. It's just a trivial change, a constant shift. But the result is, is that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the eigenstates of the number operator are identical. 
and only the eigenvalues are different. The eigenvalues in H are just the eigenvalues in N plus a half. So we're going to diagonalize N and find, find the spectrum and eigen, eigenstates of N first, and then H follows from that trivially. Okay, so uh, we'll do this in the following way. First, the first thing I want to note is, in, 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 in regard to finding the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the end of number operator N, the first thing to mention is, is that uh, this is a one-dimensional problem. Uh, the potential goes to infinity, like this, on both sides. This means that the uh, eigenfunctions have to die off exponentially at both positive and negative x. And as a result, it means that the eigenfunctions are non-degenerate. They are also, they're also discrete. They're known in the discrete spectrum, but they're non-degenerate. As we showed uh, earlier in that uh, lecture I gave on uh, the, uh, uh, some uh, properties of one-dimensional systems. Uh, so uh, let's, let's denote an eigenstate of the number operator with a symbol nu, where nu is the eigenvalue. So the n acts on nu and brings out eigenvalue nu. Now I'm using the symbol nu here because uh, at this point, for all we know, the, uh, the eigenvalue could be any number, positive, negative, fraction, integer, or anything else at this point. Uh, however, it's easy to see that nu has to be, uh, actually cannot be negative. That's because uh, n is a non-negative definite operator, as you see from just the line above. So whatever the eigenvalues are, they cannot be negative numbers. Right. Now, uh, next let's consider the state nu, and I can, I will assume this is normalized too. I say that nu nu scalar product is equal to 1. We'll assume these eigenstates are normalized. Now, let's consider the state we get when we apply the operator A, the annihilation of lowering operator, to an eigenstate of the number operator. And let's take that and let's let the number operator act on it. This is the same thing as a dagger a times a times nu. Now, allow me to move the a dagger past the a, uh, for which I need commutation relations between a and a dagger, which I meant, meant to mention before, I didn't, but I'll go over here and do it. From the commutation relations between x and p, it's straightforward to work out those between a and a dagger. So the population, and you find that the commutator of a with a dagger is equal to 1. And so, uh, this a dagger a, this becomes the same thing as a a dagger times a acting on nu with the minus sign of just a acting on nu. However, the a dagger a is n. The n acts on nu and brings out nu itself. And so the right hand side is nu minus 1 multiplying a, multiplying a acting on, on state nu like this. So, to summarize this, we have um, we have number operator n acting on a nu is equal to nu minus one acting on a nu. And thus, we can say the state a nu. Remember, nu here is is, is a is a is, is a <coughs> is assumed to be an eigenstate of n, the number operator with eigenvalue nu. And so this statement says that if we apply the number operator to a nu, we get a factor of n minus one. Therefore, a nu is an eigenvector of n with eigenvalue nu minus one. Except for one slight wrinkle, we have to worry about the possibility that a nu could be equal to zero. Because if it is equal to, now, nu is not zero, nu is normalized, but a nu could be zero. And if a nu is zero, then this equation just says zero equals zero, and it doesn't give us anything, anything new. So to make a precise statement, we can say that if a nu does not vanish, then it is an eigenstate of the number operator with an eigenvalue of nu minus one. All right. Now this raises the question, which is, does a nu equal to zero? When does, when, when does this happen? When, when, at all, does this happen? To answer this, we'll use the basic fact of Hilbert spaces that a vector can vanish if and only if its square vanishes. So let me remove the question mark and say that this, is, this condition is true if and only if you take the square of it, I get mu a dagger a nu like this equals zero. This, however, is the same thing as 
new sandwich from the number operator, which is the same thing as new times the norm of the, of the eigenstate, which we're assuming is normalized, so it's just new itself. And so what we see is the answer to win is that A acting on new is equal to zero if and only if new is equal to zero. And we put a little box around that because that's the main conclusion of this. So to go back to the formula at the top of the board, we'll say it again in light of the new information. We'll say that if nu is not equal to zero, then a nu is an eigenstate of n with eigenvalue nu minus one. If nu is equal to zero, this equation just says zero equals zero and doesn't, doesn't say anything. All right. Now, uh, we can do something similar with the racing operator. Let's consider n acting on uh, a dagger uh, nu. This is the same thing as a dagger a, which is n times a dagger acting on nu. And uh, now allow me to move this a to the right of that a dagger. So here's the commutator a dagger, which is up there. And so this gives us a dagger times a dagger times a acting on nu, plus a dagger acting on nu. Again, this is these factors are n, n acting on nu brings out nu. And the result is that it's new from this term and one from this term, new plus one times a dagger acting on new. So now we have the statement that um, new is an eigenstate of number operator with eigenvalue new. When we apply a dagger to it, we get a new state, which, if it does not vanish, is an eigenstate of n with eigenvalue new plus one. Let's go through the same thing. Does this state vanish? When, when is the possibility of a dagger nu vanishing? a dagger nu equals zero if and only if the square is equal to zero, which is nu times a a dagger nu. However, by the commutation relations, a a dagger nu is equal to a dagger a plus one, which is equal to n plus one. So we can say that a dagger nu vanishes if and only if nu plus one equals zero. But remember, nu is greater than or equal to zero, so nu plus one is always greater than zero. And the result is, is that a dagger nu never vanishes. So we're going to write this. a dagger nu, uh, a dagger nu is not equal to zero always. Let me box this part of this. Well, you know, you do it so what we've got is, is that. Uh, so um, let's let's do it this way. Let's write it this way and say that n acting on a dagger nu is equal to nu plus one a dagger nu. And to put it in words, a dagger nu is always if nu is an eigenstate of n with eigenvalue nu then a dagger nu is an eigenstate with eigenvalue nu plus one always with uh, no restrictions. <coughs> All right. Now from this it follows that the uh, quantity nu, the eigenvalue, has to be an integer. Uh, because suppose nu is not an integer, then by applying an a, is an a, 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 a squared and a cubed and so on to the nu, like this, we get eigenvalues which are nu minus one, nu minus two, and we can bring this down up to the point uh, by applying enough a, a operators, we can get up to the point where nu minus k is less than zero. Well, the eigenstates of n don't have any negative eigenvalues. So this seems to be a contradiction. And the only fact, the only way to escape the contradiction is to assume that nu is an integer. Because what happens when you apply these a operators is you're eventually going to get down to the state zero when you apply n of them. And then when you apply the next one, a to it, instead of getting some state minus one, which you get to just zero altogether. That's in this condition here, ax, AX on the zero state gives us zero. So therefore, the only, uh, the only consistent solution to these, uh, these sets of relations is that nu is actually an integer. So I'll just replace it by n, which is an integer. And in fact, it takes on the value of 0, 1, 2, and so on. Um, 
it, it has to take on all these values, all these non-negative integers, because if any one of them occurs, you can get all the others by applying raising and lowering operators. So if there's any eigenstate at all, which there has to be, then these, then this is the, these are the allowed values of integers. And so thus we have the spectrum of the number operator n that is the integer 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And from that it follows immediately that the energy eigenvalues are equal to n plus a half because, uh, because the Hamiltonian is equal to the number operator plus a half. All right. Now, um, now I'm going to worry about, uh, 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 so, so now the states, uh, so now we'll, we'll call the eigenstates n, we've got n x on n is equal to n n. This is the basic relation we're going to work with here. We also have A acting on N is proportional to N minus 1. And we have A dagger acting on N is proportional to uh, N plus 1. Summarizes some of the things we've uh, learned so far. Uh, let me call, in the first equation involving A, let me call the proportionality constant CN. Let's say a n acting on n is some proportional to the constant c n times n minus one. Uh, c n is in general a complex number. To find it, we can square both sides of this equation. We square the left hand side, we get n sandwiched around a dagger a. And squaring the right hand side, we get the absolute value of c n squared times the norm of n minus one. But we're assuming these states are normalized, so that norm is equal to one. On the left hand side, we have the number operator in the middle here. And the result is that C n squared is equal to is equal to n just to call the number of n. And therefore, C n is equal to a phase factor e to the i, let's call it alpha n times the square root of n. And so um, uh, we can now write out some of these relations, uh, these annihilation relations here. If we apply A to the state 1, we get e to the i alpha 1 times the square root of 1 times 0. If we apply A to the state 2, the annihilation operator, we get e to the i alpha 2 times the square root of 2 acting on 0. A acting on 3, we get e to the i alpha 3. I'm just writing down some of these so you can see the pattern. This is, this is actually not good. It's 1 square root square root of 3 times the state 2 and so on. This is, this is the information we have so far from these creation and annihilation relations. Now at this point, let's take these states 1, 2, 3, and so on and redefine them so as to absorb these phases alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And if we do that, then we've established phase conventions for the states 1, 2, 3, and so on, and these phases either the i alpha go away. In the process of doing that, we don't change the phase of the state zero. But what we are, in effect, doing is linking the phase conventions for all of the excited states to the phase convention for the ground state. And so, with that convention, I can erase these phase factors, and now there is only one phase convention for the eigenstates, and that's the phase convention for the ground state zero. And if we do this, then I'll draw the, the result in the little box here. It is that result that I think you know is that A acts on N because this is the square root of N times N minus 1. By a completely similar argument, working with the raising operators, we find that A dagger acting on N is the square root of N plus 1 times N plus 1. These are relations I'm sure you memorized for an undergraduate exam sometime, so there they are. As it turns out, it's not necessary to introduce any additional phase conventions for the A-dagger equation. The phase changes that I made over here are all you need to do. Then this A-dagger equation automatically follows. The effect of these phase conventions is to make the matrix elements of the raising and lowering operators in the energy eigenbasis to make those matrix elements real. And that's the most convenient choice for dealing with the right oscillator. Okay, that's all for you.